title, The Seat at the Table with Play Versus Game Changers. I'm Danielle, your host. A little bit about me. I'm the inaugural head coach of esports at Lawrence Tech Technological University. Um, LTU is a small private college in Southfield, Michigan. We're kicking off our first season in fall 2021, and I've been tasked with uh, creating a team. So I am looking for recruits right now. I will link my info in the chat momentarily, but um, I have had a long history with video games, and I'm excited to it, for, for it to be a part of my career. Uh, I graduated from Oakland University with a bachelor's degree. OU is in Rochester, Michigan. Um, I love fitness and I'm currently training for a half marathon and a triathlon. Um, I like a multitude of games as well, uh, particularly first person shooters. <laughs> so I, my favorite part of gaming is the multiplayer experience because you can just come together and play with a, a big group of people from all over. Uh, so I hope to become a strong female role model in the gaming community one day, and I look forward to the future of esports. So I'm honored to be your host today and part of the Game Ch Changer initiative with Play Versus and these amazing, lovely ladies that we're going to talk to in just a moment in the esports industry. So Jessica, can you introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Jessica. I'm a senior product designer at Play Versus. I've been working recently on the new esports integrations and the match day experience. But before that, I've worked at a couple startups, uh, Grindr, Patreon, and Pivotal Labs. And I also have a new puppy. So sorry for the background noise. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take it back. <laughs> All right, Summer, your turn. Wait, but first, what kind of puppy? right? Need to know. Oh, wait, she dipped. Okay. It's fine. Um, so hi. Yeah. I'm Summer. I am director of chain operations at counter logic gaming, uh, which basically means I oversee all of the esport properties that are not league of legends for us right now. So that's uh, pretty cool. All right. And Elaine, did I say your name right? I'm sorry. Yes, you did. Is this working <laughs> by the way? I'm having, I've been having issues with it. Yeah. You have the yeah. best mic. Okay, cool. All right, so hi, my name's Elaine. I'm a game designer and developer at Elaine Media. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I'm tasked with designing gameplay and um, implementing it as well. So I do a little bit of coding and a little bit of design. Um, and we just work on all kinds of projects at, at Elaine. So I'm really grateful and, and super, super blessed to have a job that I, that I love and to do what I do. Um, it's like a dream. It's a, so definitely a dream job. Right, awesome. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Uh, failure to many people can be seen as a setback while others see it as a setup. So as situation would say in Jersey Shore, the comeback is always greater than the setback. So let's dive right in uh, and see how you learn to embrace failure. Uh, so first, I guess we'll do like a round robin and I'll, I'll ask you questions. So uh well, well it's jessica's not back yet right okay so we'll go summer first since she's in my window first um tell us about a time when you were inspired by a professional failure and what made you change the perspe perspective about the situation um oddly enough my venture into esport was the response to an epic failure um the, the main failure in my life that I have not been able to shake so far is what I perceive as my failure in education. Um, for me, it took me eight years to actually achieve my bachelor's. And I finally settled on the degree of psychology in the end. And I was looking to get a master's afterward. And I just kind of reflected on you know, that failure that I felt of not being able to complete my academic goals and the time frame that I set at the institution that I had set out originally for, um, it just felt like a giant pile of failure. Um, so I kind of said to myself, you know what, like, I don't see a reason to keep banging my head against the wall. And I had to reassess, you know, who I was as a person, where my strengths were, 
And I kind of was like, maybe academia is just not my thing. And I should try to pursue things that make sense. And that's around the time that esport came along. So it was really that reconciliation with the failure um, and that reassessment that really kind of just changed things up. You're awesome. So did you change your personal brand careers or goals after failing any of that? Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. How? I mean, I was, I was like, Hey, I really want to be a therapist. Right. Like my most important thing was when I was in college, I really struggled with mental health. That was okay. the thing that made it so difficult. Yeah. Um, just kind of balancing everything. And when I first got into college, I, I started out at Vassar, which is a highly selective institution. It's just really intensely competitive. And to combine that with mental health issues, it was just such an awful combination. So knowing that that was my personal experience and taking those small steps along the journey, trying to push forward with my education at the same time, I really understood that what I wanted at the bottom of my heart is to make sure that there was no young adult that was going to go through something similar that did not feel like they had somebody that had their back. Um, so I knew that that's where I wanted to go. And I had in my head that the only way I could do that was be a counselor. But I knew that that was probably the most painful way I can go about it because of the experience I had been having all along. Um, so I really started reassessing what I could bring to the table, where my strengths like were lying and you know, what I really wanted and what my purpose was. And I just reinvented myself, found eSport and found a way to enter into that space where I could utilize those skills and start helping people. Yeah. I'd say that was a comeback, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? So, so you are, did you have any, like, did you have a routine or any tools that got you out of that? I think it was just like stubborn will at that point. Yeah. Um, I do have a, a habit of getting really pissed off at myself. I do not enjoy failure. <laughs> and I certainly do not like the feeling of being a failure. So, you know, they probably like the most clutch tool that I use is knowing that that's my cycle. I go from that moment where I'm just like, ah, oh, I, I suck. I super suck. And like the first step I have to do is be like, no, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. So taking it off my identity and making it something separate that I can then deal with and then being like, oh, it doesn't suck. It was just not really what I wanted. And then you can say, well, what did you actually want? What were the different things that happened that could have brought what you want, right? And then all of a sudden you have these new points of entry to start deconstructing where things went wrong and what can happen next that can set you up for success in the future. Um, so that's kind of like the primary tool. It's like a mental one. It's like knowing yourself and knowing exactly what that crappy voice in your head is going to say to you and knowing exactly what you need to say back being that friend to yourself and speaking to yourself kindly so that you can pull yourself out of the hole and get to a better place. Yeah. I mean, we really are our own worst critics, right? So, um, and so I know that you, you said you had some mental health issues. So did you share or talk about any of your failures or the mental health issues with people? Or no, God, no, <laughs> that was like the most challenging thing it's odd. Like, I really don't like pe people seeing me sweat, like in any way, especially people I care about my parents and my friends. I don't want them to worry about me. Um, it's like, that is a failure in and of itself to know that I could be painting somebody else with my own pain. Um, yeah. so it was really held close to the cuff and that's probably what made it so hard to come out of it in the end. Um, you know, now I try to be a little bit more transparent and just be honest, like today's a really bad day, right? Um, I have a really open and honest relationship with my husband where it's just like, you know what? I'm feeling really vulnerable, super sensitive. If you look at me sideways, I'm probably gonna yell, right? And just, <laughs> you know, being really clear about where I'm at in my headspace and that transparency goes a really long way. Yeah. Do you have any uh, recommendations for resources um, or communities that'll help you process in in your not necessarily failures but maybe mental health space um i don't have anything that like sticks out into my mind that i would push personally i believe that everybody's situation is different and i think that different resources work for different people yeah. for me i utilized a lot of different resources when i was in school i tried to use the school resources but didn't really find that they actually wanted to help me it felt like they were trying to 
you know, avoid liability. That was my personal take. Um, so then I pushed further. I was just like, let me look into counseling and therapy. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to be a therapist myself because of how much I was helped. Um, so that is another resource that you can go after. And there's like great places that you can find online, especially with COVID. There's a lot of people that you can just call at this point and get te telehealth services. So looking into yeah. those, just hopping on psychology today is a great website to find a therapist near you that has the capability of doing telemedicine. Yeah. Um, so those things are really, really helpful to overcome your mental health and like never ignore your support system. I think that was my biggest downfall, not leaning into the people that really cared about me and cultivating the support system, you know, supporting those people back so that they wanted to help me. Um, yeah. All of that counts. Awesome. Okay, um, I will talk to Elaine now. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. So we're embracing our, our failures here. So tell us about a time that you were um, also inspired by a professional failure and what made you change your perspective on it? Well, I've had a lot of failures in my life, which is why I was like, sign me up for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> but oh man like with with my life experiences it's been like um it's it's not just the professional failure but it's how also the personal failures and like relationships and things like that have bled in to to my prof professional like track you know and have hindered me from uh, or or at least um kind of like held me back from chasing after the things that I that I wanted um, and the things that I really wanted to do. Um, so for me, uh, what I, my, I, I guess I'll start from, from like where my failure stemmed from is actually what has led me to, to where I am now, actually. It's very much like they go hand in hand. Um, and being Latina, uh, it has a big weight on it because I'm all about, um, pleasing my family and bringing honor to my family. Like that's a really big cultural thing. And growing up, my parents were successful professionals in their fields um, and they were in pharmaceuticals and IT. Um, and they really did not want me to chase after that because behind the scenes, they knew what was going on and they didn't, kind of, they didn't want me to go through that. So they were like, Elaine, you're, you're gonna be a doctor. And I know you like all these other things, but you're gonna be a doctor. <laughs> so I was just like, you know, like, I don't know if I want to be that, but fine. You know what I mean? Because I, I wanted to honor them and I wanted to please them. And I did want to have a career that was successful. And in my mind, being a doctor and being in medicine, that's a successful career. Um, so when I went to apply to college, I am um, sorry, my, my work, <laughs> my work slack is <laughs> just okay. Kidding. Sorry. Um, um, so I remember um, when I applied to college and I applied for biomedical engineering with a pre-med track, which is a really heavy curriculum. So you're talking about engineering plus medicine, like, like I really was trying to kill myself. There. Yeah. Um, but uh, Goals I applied though, right? to it. Yeah, I applied to it, and my first failure was that I wasn't even admitted into the engineering school because my GPA was not high enough, even though I was in the top 15% of my class. Um, so the requirements were just really strenuous. And I remember that being like my first failure. And I was like, wow, I can't even get into the school that I need to, to, to chase this career. And I really felt down and I, I internalized it as, wow, even though I studied so hard throughout high school and took all those honor courses, took the AP classes and really did excel. Cause I really did. It was like, wow, this is not good enough for me to chase after this future that my family wants me to, to chase. Um, but nonetheless, even though I didn't get into the engineering school, I decided to enter college with an undeclared major um, and still take the required courses to chase after that major and hopefully with fingers crossed, apply again so that I could internally from within the un undeclared like track switch over to engineering. Um, and things changed where like, as soon as I started taking those pre-rec classes, I failed so many classes. And I'm not, I, like, I, it was the first time in my life where I felt dumb. I was just like, like, what happened? Like, was high school, like, a, the easy, like, it, what happened? Like, what happened to me? Am I, did I just lose my IQ? <laughs> like, like, I felt awful. And there were required classes that I needed, like, 
point blank to, to enter engineering. So calculus, um, like organic chemistry, things that are like physics for engineers, it was, there were really tough courses and I failed <laughs> yeah. them and, and I, I felt terrible. And that was to a point where I sat down with my parents with like my eyes bawling. And I was like, I know that you guys want me to be a doctor, but I don't think this is for me. And like, here are, here are my grades. Like I'm trying and I can't. So um, my parents were like, you know what, if you really don't think that this is for you, like try to find something that works for you and that you love. Um, so I had to go to my dean and, and tell, tell my dean, hey, like, I really want to graduate. Like, I really do my, I really want to get this bachelor's degree. What can I do within these, these two and a half years that I have left to, to earn that degree? What, what major do I ha- can I take? Um, because I don't, I don't want to um, spend five, six years like some of my friends were, where they kept changing their majors over and over. And because they changed, they added more time to their, to their, to their degree. And I was like, I don't want to enter that cycle because, you know, financial reasons, because of emotional reasons, I just didn't want to do that. So um, my dean was like, hey, there's this information technology degree. It's only like X amount of credits. You can achieve it in two years. And let's see where that takes you. And it was like literally the degree that my parents did not want me to chase after. So um, I went back and I was like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And they, they so were very supportive, even though a bit hesitant. And um, I aced, like, like right away, my first semester was like A plus. And I was just like, this, I think this is, I'm good at this. I, I think I can do it. Um, and then it ended up being that from that curriculum, there was a games course. Um, that professor became my mentor. He recommended me for some institutes and things like that. Lo and behold, I went to grad school for game design and entered the industry. And it was literally all because I pivoted from that culture and like those expectations. I just pivoted into be like, you know what, what do I want to do in 10 years? What do, what do I see myself doing? Will I be happy in, in 10 years in this career? Um, and can I push myself to do just as well and make my family and myself proud by, cho- by, by pivoting? Um, and that's what ended, ended up happening. But that was really a tough journey and a, and a tough process to go through where you thought, I thought that I could have done it, but I actually was not able to. And just because I wasn't able to did not mean that I was actually a failure, just me that I needed to change things. And change is not a bad thing, you know? And I think we equate those two a lot, right? Where it's just like, you feel at something, you change something, those are bad things, but that's not true. It's all in the way that you see it. And in the way that you use that to either propel yourself to the next level or allow it to hold you back. Well, change is super uncomfortable. I think that's why people get stuck in their ways. Um, but are, do you have any like suggestions for say somebody in in high school that would pick a major? I mean, they're, we're telling kids that are 18 years old that they have to pick their, their job for the rest of their life and their future. Uh, if I was, you know, I'm, I'm in my thirties when I was 18, I'm, I'm not doing what I thought I was doing when I was 18. So do you have any suggestions or resources for that? I would say, um, like be honest with yourself, sit down with yourself and just make a list of the things that you like to do. Um, and that's not including of like, um, just, uh, your hobbies, but things that you actually enjoy doing, like you, do you like communicating with people? Do you like giving advice? Um, do you see yourself as somebody who um, can work with others on a constant basis or you, would you rather work alone? Like make an assessment of who you are and what, where would you would like to see yourself in 10 years and use that list to kind of figure out what are some things that apply to those things. And then do research online. There's so many resources and information that is completely free on YouTube um, and on Google. And all it takes is just five, 10 minutes of your time and to research some links and figure out, you know, some good articles or a good blog to read, or even some good books. Sometimes you'll find recommendations for good books to read on specific things. So that's what I did when, when I was in that phase of my life where I was very undecided of what I wanted to do. Um, when it came to making that decision of changing my major with my dean, like I actually did have to sit down and be like, do I actually want to do that? Um, and I made my list. So that helped me a lot. 
And I know it has helped a lot of my friends. So I, I definitely recommend that. Yeah. Um, all right, Jessica, it is your turn. Uh, hi. So tell us about a time when you were inspired by a professional failure as well. Uh, what made you change your perspective about that situation? Yeah, so I, I definitely relate to the fact that I've had a couple of professional failures in my life so far, uh, but I tried to pick one that I think would be a little bit uh, dramatic or over the top, really where my sort of like career and body were just like, stop, you need to do something different. Um, so that's the one I'll talk about. Um, a couple startups ago, uh, you know, I'm a designer, I was working with an engineering team and sort of the head of that team, who was also my manager at the time, so kind of my mentor, um, left the company. And so I decided, you know, I still want this to, to launch. I like, I can do anything. Um, why don't I just do his job too? Um, and so I was like, I'll do my job and his job, uh, something I'd never done before. And at the same time, you know, I had been working a little bit on my physical health. So I have an autoimmune disease and I was working with a specialist to try to get on a different medication at the same time. And while I was going on that process and in that project, I was like working late. I was, I was taking on a lot and I didn't really listen to my body. So I knew I was stressed, but I thought some of the new symptoms that I was sort of experiencing we're just stressed. Uh, turns out, totally not. I was allergic to that new medication. I actually collapsed in my startup's office um, and was in the hospital for like 10 days while I tried to figure out what was wrong. And it was like a really dramatic way for me to be like, oh, my personal brand is like, I can do anything. Like I'll do my job and everyone else's job. And like, I really love to be like in control uh, and like with a smile, like I'll take anything on and really had to realize like, okay, there were a couple, couple things there. I think I was able to change my goals um, kind of realize that, uh, you know, I can't always take on so much at once and I really have to maximize my output with what I'm able to put in. Uh, so if like, you know, things are going on in your personal life or, you know, things are going hard, like in a professional way, you're like manager and like a team lead leaves, you know, try to like be honest about what you can take on. That was definitely a wake up call for me. Yeah. I imagine what did, uh, when you came back to work, what did everyone say to you? How, cause if you were the go-getter, all of a sudden yeah. it kind of, you, you were vulnerable at that moment. It's true. I think it was really shocking for folks. Um, just because I think everyone, you know, you're in a startup fast paced environment. Like you don't, uh, you don't really think about it. If everyone's kind of like young and seemingly healthy for the most part. Um, and, uh, yeah, people were really, really kind, uh, a, big change for me. You know, I was used to like working late hours, being like always available. They're like, Hey, if you need mornings off, if you need to take a break, if you need to like step a little bit back from a project and just do one job, not three, like do that. Um, so it was really nice to do a reset. Uh, and I definitely got a little bit closer with the leadership at the company. Um, because, you know, since I didn't have a manager at the time, I was able to kind of have a skip level as my mentor in the interim where I, before I was like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need to be managed. You know, I got this solo. So yeah, definitely a, you know, a good reminder that, you know, you do need people, especially when you're trying something new to kind of be there to mentor you, make sure that you're, um, you know, you're still putting your, your sort of self and your health first. Yeah. I mean, if we don't take care of ourselves, we really don't perform as well as we could. I think that's the Absolutely. biggest <laughs> takeaway I've learned in the last two years is our own health will make us way more productive. So um, how do you like share and talk about your failures with say other people? Uh, you know, the dreaded question, tell me about a time you failed. <laughs> yeah. So in an interview setting, it's, it's so Odd. I think now that I'm interviewing other people for roles, I kind of have a different perspective. I think whenever I'm interviewing someone else, I just want to know, like, does that person have the self-awareness? Um, you know, can they own up to a mistake they made without blaming someone else? And then how early were they able to like recognize and, and correct that mistake themselves or with a team? reaching out for help. So I usually tell a bit of a different story where that one, uh, you know, I didn't recognize it at all uh, and moved on pretty quickly. Um, so I tend to answer it in one that <laughs> paints me in a little bit of a better light, you know, yeah. um, what feels like a failure 
um, oftentimes it's just change. I think like Elaine and, and Summer were mentioning, um, the one I, I usually tell is I joined a company, realized within the first couple of weeks that I didn't really vibe with the same values that the executive team had. I was like, I'll stick it out, see how long I could go. Only lasted like nine months. Um, so, you know, sometimes you just have to recognize like, um, you know, the earlier and the more, more honest you can be about sort of where your values are and, and what you want to uh, change and achieve. And if there's a, a breaking point, like just be honest and, and move on. And right after that job, I, I found an even better one. So just gotta be, gotta be honest. Yeah. When one door closes, another one opens, right? Absolutely. And it was actually kind of fun. Like with that one, um, it didn't just open for me. Like I had friends who were feeling very similarly and then left and like got huge raises. And it was, it actually ended up being like a really good, good thing for a couple of folks that I knew. So excited about that. Yeah, that worked out. So any recommendations for resources um, or communities that'll help process failures? Yeah, I feel like in terms of processing failures, like I definitely love like talk therapy. I'm a big proponent of that. So if you're able to like with your health insurance or with school resources, yeah. definitely recommend that. Um, if you are kind of more um, like isolated or, or you're having trouble finding those resources, I definitely benefited um, a couple years ago from BetterHelp, um, which is one that I recommend. They kind of match you up with someone. Um, and I know that they have kind of like a different pricing which is helpful. Um, but yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, rely on your, your close network um, as much as possible. And, and yeah, that's what I, that's what I recommend. Awesome. Danielle, can I just pop in here really fast? Yeah. Um, because I realized I abandoned my notes when I answered this question the first time. Um, <laughs> We're coming back to you anyway. So <laughs> seriously, if you guys have not discovered Brene Brown. Oh, my friend would love sugar. you. <laughs> Holy sugar, the chick totally revolutionized the way I think about failure. Like, honest to God, she has an awesome podcast. She's written a ton of awesome books. Um, and she has great TED Talks out there just about getting yourself vulnerable and out there and saying, screw it. If I fail, I fail, but at least I'm living, right? Like, she's yeah. phenomenal. Um, so totally go after that. And in terms of, like, actually how you open up about failure... I think one of the most important things that you need to do is make peace with the worst outcome that you have in your head. Um, because like universally, like say opening up in a forum like this, like I'm usually terrified to talk about my struggle with academics, but I'm just like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen here? These people might think I'm a little bit dumber than they started. All right. Well, I'm still doing great. Right. I still have people in my life that think I'm intelligent and like, I can live with this worst outcome. Um, and like the other thing is just like rip off the bandaid. Usually the recovery process is not as bad as you think. And the more you prove to yourself that you can do it, the easier it becomes down the line. Yeah. Well, like you said, in, in doing this though, you probably are helping somebody. Even if you just help one person, it's still better than no people, right? <laughs> so um, so yes. kind of leads into redefining success. So uh, I'm gonna ask you, what does success look like for you? Oh man. Um, it was funny when I got on today, I was talking to Melanie about it and I was like, these questions are actually really hard to answer now. And not for the reason you might think it's because it's been a really long time since I've let myself just flat out consider something a failure. And it's because most of the time when I'm looking at my overall trajectory career or personal wise, it's about generating forward momentum. Most of the time it's about being experimental, saying I have a hunch that something's gonna work, but I won't know until I try. And even if you get to a point where you hit a wall, it was like, mm, well, maybe that wasn't supposed to work anyway. My hunch was incorrect, so what? Move on to the next thing. Um, so a lot of success is really about generating that forward momentum, just getting the next step that moves you forward and figuring out how far it can take you. And when you hit the end of that road, pivot to a new one. So um, how would you, cause you kind of answer some of the, our, our tough questions there. So uh, how would you respond to receiving like negative feedback from a manager or even just a peer, anyone really? Um, interesting question you know along the lines of what success looks like a lot of times nowadays it's like am I achieving the feeling of okayness 
right? Like, am I okay in my skin today? So a lot of times where like my self-perceived fear of failure um, keeps me from that, okay, I can do this feeling. And I feel like you need to do whatever you can to get to that place where you're comfortable that no matter what challenge you have in front of you, you're like, whatever, I have what it takes. And if I don't have what it takes, I was never meant to do that thing anyway. Um, and now when I am confronted with failure or what could be perceived as one like negative feedback, a lot of times, like, I think my previous boss was afraid to offer me any negative feedback because he knew if he did, I would find like the one kernel of bad. And I'm just like, that. what are we talking about? Um, and I'd sit there and I'd just ask a ton of questions, right? I'm just like, this is the, this is the one growth point. This is the point that's not working. Yes, let me lead into this. Um, so asking me a ton of questions, wanting to understand the feedback fully, right? Sometimes you can get the wrong impression or somebody says you know, something in a way that they didn't actually mean. So getting down to the heart of the issue is really important when receiving negative feedback. Um, and then of course, turning it on the other person being like, hey man, if you're gonna give me negative feedback, then you need to offer me a solution. <laughs> you know, yeah. what do you see as an opportunity for me to do better? In your eyes, how can I do better with you? Um, or if it's like with other teammates that you're working with, like, okay, let me get in a conversation with that person. If they perceive me this way, then I, maybe they have some insight on how I can improve. And the final piece of that is just getting back into it, iterating, trying to see what people are talking about and seeing what you can do about it. Yeah. So, um, when building a resume or a portfolio, how can people showcase the, their resilience and success? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of times people will go on their resume and they either say what they did, okay, sure, <laughs> um, or what they accomplished, right? This like this right. one marker where it's just like, this is the time I nailed it. But realistically, like success is not a one-time thing. It's a, like a way of being, right? Mm -hmm. You are the kind of person that consistently sets yourself up for new success. It's not just something that happens upon you. Um, so one thing that you can do really well is don't just list the achievement, list the trajectory. How did you get there? Um, so oddly enough, speaking about failure, when I applied to CLG, I talked about how I got fired from my previous job in the job interview. Um, oh, and they hired you still? That Get sounds it, crazy, but there was a reason for it. When I was working with the previous team, after the first split of working with that team as their performance coach, they let me go so they can get a chef. I literally got fired as the performance coach so that they can have somebody to make food. Um, and the reason why I brought that up is because that team got a few weeks into their next season, realized the spot that they were in and they're just like, oh, and I was smart about it where I stayed in contact with some of the players on the team and even negotiated working one-on-one -on -one with one of the players. So I was getting the inside scoop on how the team was doing. And when I heard it was going down, I immediately hit up that manager and was just like, Hey, I hear things aren't so great. And it, right away, they're just like, ah, yeah, can we have you back, man? <laughs> so that was a moment where I was really able to tell the full journey and the full story. What would have looked like a complete and utter failure was actually a huge triumph. And not to mention the split that I was there the first time and the split I was there the second time that team won championships. Okay. Well, they did. I think they made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, well, they learned. So that was the important part. They learned from their failures and made a success. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, exactly. but like, don't be afraid of talking Pivot. about the journey because that's, that's what makes you interesting. And that's what mm -hmm. brings color to your accomplishments. Yeah. All right. Um, Elaine, so how, how do you, uh, define success and what does it look like for you? Um, you know, I feel like growing, like growing up, you are always told that your success is, you know, you work hard, right. And you put in everything that you need to do. You do everything you need to do so that you can set yourself up to be better and do better every day. But in the past, I would say year or two. I have come to realize this for myself that what makes me successful is actually the people around me who are supporting me and that are uplifting me. And they're the ones who deserve like the credit because they have helped me get here. Without them, I really wouldn't have done anything. Um, and this has been so relevant to, I'm, I'm a co-founder of Latinx in Gaming. Um, we're a nonprofit for the Latin American community in the games industry. And our 
org has been existing for like four years, but it wasn't until last year that we boomed. And it was because we realized that for ourselves as we were like, we cannot do anything by ourselves staff. We need to include our community in what we're doing. How can we do that? And as soon as we did that, everything changed. And now we got a bunch of awards. Like we were on the game awards. We were giving the global gaming citizen award and that would have never happened if we stepped out of our comfort zone and we're like, we have to work with other folks and we have to include them in our conversations. It's not the six of us staff and right. we need to unify and we need to collaborate and partner with people or else we're just gonna stay stuck um, doing the same thing over and over again. And we're never going to to um, to run that race and, and get to a, to a goal. We're just gonna stay stagnant. Um, so to me, what has changed is that now that I don't see my successes me, Lane, putting in the work, me, Lane, doing certifications, me, Lane, donating money. I see it as like, how can I invest in other people's success? How can I surround myself with people who are supported and want to see me grow and also in turn want my help so that they can also grow? Like I'm, I'm viewing success as a, like partnerships, collaboration with people, serving other people instead of it being all about me and what I want to do and what I want to get out of something like that whole mentality of being transactional and oh how how can I get to know this person so that they can give me a one-up at an interview or whatever like that whole I like idea of networking where it's just like trading business cards and being superficial like like I have come to realize that, that is the wrong way to actually build a network because the most important thing is building relationships with people so yeah. that they remember your name so that they can plug you in in conversations because they know they gotten to know you um, and exactly. they vouch for you. And that's super important. That's actually super game changing when, when you realize that networking is not about how many people you know, but the quality of the relationships, the people you know, um, and the domino effect that that creates across everybody's networks. Um, and to me, that was mind blowing. And I would have never realized that on, on, until, like it would have been me. It would have been, it's literally other people who taught me that. and I learn from their experiences and their failures um, yeah. so that I don't have to repeat those mistakes. Yeah. So how has it kind of changed over, success changed over your career um, or your definition of success, I should say? I, um, and nobody likes to say, <laughs> I feel like nobody likes to say this, but for me, like I have noticed that I've become so much more humble and down to earth because I don't have my, I, I'm not targeting things all the time. And I used to be like that a lot. I'm very old goal, goal oriented and um, very much about like setting uh, milestones for myself. Like I'm just that type of person thinking like five years ahead, but I have humbled myself in the way that I'm like, you know what? Um, instead, for example, of putting in time to get a certificate and one up in my programming skills, I'm gonna take that time and mentor somebody and help them with their design, their their programs, whatever it may be. So I've decided to like give back um, and not make it everything about me. Like I would rather push other people um, to like do talks and things like that. So like my success as a designer or as an advocate in the games industry, like all of that, um, I, I've seen things have been changing and for the better because I have decided to kind of take the backseat a little bit and allow other people to shine. Um, and in turn, that just apparently just makes me shine more, which is really weird, right? Because like yeah. now I'm backstage, but people are like, Elaine is awesome. Like she's the go-to person for this. And I'm just like, no, <laughs> do yeah. your thing. And then like, I'm here to support you. But yeah, I've noticed that in like the past year in my life. And it's weird. Like if you would have met me two years ago and you would have seen like, oh, Elaine's really like a go-getter. Like she's really striving or to be to be the best at whatever she is and it's true I still am doing that but I kind of like I don't know I've, I've reeled it in quite a bit um and I'm just so focused on other people like I, I feel like that has been my the biggest the biggest change in, in my life is just focusing on people around me instead of myself all right so how did it impact your uh next failure you encountered your your opinion <laughs> Oh man, well, at my job, um, we've had a lot of changes um, and one of them is the lead. So in an independent game studio, 
the hierarchy can vary. But at my studio, we have the CEO and he's involved very directly in everything. So he's almost like our creative director, which usually is never the case. Usually you have somebody else who, who fills that role. But our CEO, um, because he's CEO, right? Like it's hard to talk to somebody and like give them feedback and stuff in design when he's CEO too. <laughs> so it's like, how can you respectfully communicate things where they may not be good things, good decisions that we're doing in the design of a game, for example, um, things that we need to polish and iterate. But in order to do that, they need to be called out first. And when the idea comes from somebody like a CEO and you have to, as a game designer, be like, hey, by the way, this idea is not gonna work. <laughs> like, you, how, how do you like communicate? How do you use the proper vocabulary? Um, for me, that was uh, something that I that I had to tweak and, it, and I was able to do it because I was focusing on other people, right? So yeah. by learning how to communicate with all these different types of personalities in my job, in my studio, all these different types of people, I was able to grow in the way that my thought process um, was, I guess my thought processes, my vocabulary, the way that I'm reading people so that I, I can tell somebody's upset I can tell somebody's not having a good time. And by building those skill sets, it like prepared me to have tough conversations with the CEO where he respects me so much so that he brings me into meetings that I shouldn't be because he trusts me. Um, and I'm one of the youngest people at my studio. Um, and it was literally all just because I took the time to be a good team member. And now he sees me as a team leader, which is, it, it's really weird, um, but it was all because um, sometimes you do just need to step back and you need to evaluate things. You need to um, not be emotional, not take things personally. In games, you in, in game design, like design period, you cannot take things personally. And it's usually never about you as a designer and the faults that you are doing wrong. It's usually most often than not, it's, there's something wrong with the design that needs to be uh, fixed. Um, so that's something too that I have been learning with directly with my CEO, right? Who's my lead, um, having those tough conversations, but being able to articulate them in a way where he feels good that I'm being honest, but at the same time, he appreciates that I am giving resistance to decisions that could be potentially uh, detrimental to the project, you know, six months down the line, yeah. you know, so I think, but I think, I hope I answered the question. I think I went you did. <laughs> I, I'm going to hit you with a curveball, though. So okay. um, you said that, you know, because it kind of has to do with success. Well, it doesn't kind of. It has to do with success. You said that your parents um, weren't super happy or didn't want you to go into IT and go into this uh, or some realm of this. What do they think now? Like, are they? My parents are super what proud are their of me. Opinions? <laughs> Were they? I am like. <laughs> yeah. I mean. It's come to the point where they're like, have you seen what Elena's done? Look at my daughter in these articles and like sharing with like my aunts and uncles and cousins. And at first that wasn't the case. At first it's just like, you know, we're really concerned about Elaine and what she's doing um, uh, and the direction that she's choosing in life. Like she's not married. She doesn't have kids. And that's a big deal coming from Puerto Rican household where like my mom had me when she was 21. Um, and my grandma had started having kids and she was like 17. So like we have this history of all the women in my family having kids young and you come to me or my cousins who are women and we all focus on our careers instead. So um, all this time, she's been focusing on my career, building networks, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm 30, gonna be 31 and I'm still not married. Like I still don't have kids. But like now I think my parents have realized like that's not a failure. It's not a failure that I chose to not build a family or have kids or focus on other things that other women focus on in their younger years, I focus on other things. And they, I think they appreciate that now because they have seen now what has come out of all that waiting, you know? Cause at first you're like, well, you're, you know, you, you need to hurry up, but the time's ticking, you know what I mean? But when they see me like at an award show or they see me be part of a panel with, with other folks, like, then, then they understand and it clicks more. Yeah. Um, and it's just like all those sacrifices mean something towards um, my future. 
Um, but they're super proud now. And I think that they wouldn't wouldn't be able to see me as anything else other than like Elaine works at games. They don't even understand yeah. what I do. They just say <laughs> Elaine works in games. <laughs> yeah, it's a good answer. Yeah. I I will say I, I'm thankful that you actually said that because we're as women, and I think most all of us in here can say that um, we're really put on this pedestal to be like, when are you gonna have a family? When are you gonna have kids? Where if you focus on your career, guess what? It's okay to focus on your career. It's okay to do whatever makes you happy. So, all right, Jessica. It's also okay to have kids. Oh yeah. While being awesome at your career. I'm yes. like literally pregnant right now. Literally and it's okay to do whatever. Like, you can go for it. I got hired at CLG when I was pregnant too. Like every single time I'm getting a promotion, it's when I'm pregnant. So you, you can have what you want as long as you're willing to go after. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Baby number two, you said? Yeah, two. You got, know what you're having? Have a girl, have a I'm boy gonna... on the way, collect the hey. whole set. There you go. <laughs> Matching hair, right? <laughs> um, all right, Jessica, how does success look? Or I can say how, what does success look like for you? <laughs> Yeah, I, I love this question and I took some time to think about it. Um, yeah, I think I would say that success now looks definitely different for me than it did. Um, I think if I'm able to work on a problem that feels like it matters, not only to me, but for someone else, like I'm, I'm solving something for someone else or I'm creating a new opportunity that didn't otherwise exist, especially for an underserved group, I, I feel really excited. I feel like I'm I'm successful. Um, I also think success for me, if I'm in a place that I'm working with other people that are like inspiring and also feel like they're able to, to teach me things, I can, I can teach them things that makes me feel really good and feel like I'm in a successful place. And then, yeah, if I feel like I'm able to step away from it um, and, and focus on my personal life if needed, you know, if there's a, there's a bit of balance built in, I feel like that is like the biggest like luxury of success that I've been able to, to have so far. So yeah, I think those, those things so far have been my, my definition today. Definitely have changed though. Yeah. Um, so since they changed, how, how have they changed <laughs> over your career? Yeah, I think for me, especially growing up, so I grew up in the in the South, uh, I'm from Georgia, and I went to college. And then immediately, you know, I, I moved out to San Francisco when I graduated, I was kind of in that the tech bubble where everyone was like really comparing like salaries and titles. And, and you could see folks even in startups really young getting like director or VP in their title. I basically just thought to be successful meant I had to like start up hop and try to like get as much, you know, recognition as possible in the shortest amount of time. Um, I definitely have realized that the thing that has stayed with me longer has been the relationships that I've made at those companies and like the working through the failures and, and shared successes rather than really trying to like game the system just because like the system kind of exists uh, to be yeah. a little gamed, but yeah, it's definitely changed. So how did your success impact, like say your next failure? Yeah, I would say thinking about like going through failure in the past, it definitely puts things into perspective. So like even there's a launch I'm working on right now um, that you know, it's, it's been a little bumpy. Like we've like pushed back a date or two. And I, you know, I think in, if this were my first job or even second job, I'd be a little nervous. Um, and now I think I, I can put it into perspective. I'm like, is the team, like, are we still working together? Are we still communicating well? Like personally, do we feel like this is going to be like a good thing for our users and provide a lot of value? Yes. Like, are we still kind of within the, the window that we want it to be? Yes. And so I think, I think thinking about, how success is like, yeah, we're still working with people that are inspiring. We're still able to take a step back for our personal life if we need to. And we're still like ultimately creating like new value, new opportunities. So it still checks all the boxes where I think in the past, just be like, oh man, I'm not working hard enough or um, I'm not doing everything I could to make sure that it happens on time. Just know that I'm part of a bigger group that's, that's still working well together. Yeah. So since you're, you know, you, you're saying that you don't care as much about deadlines, how, how would you receive negative feedback or I guess flack from your boss? Cause you, everybody has a boss, whether it's somebody that's up there, whether it's a board or a boss. 
Yeah, I think Elaine mentioned it since I'm also in kind of a design space too. Like there is a part of being a designer where you've just gone through so many design crits. Like you have to be egoless, like, uh, and really kind of take yourself out of the work you do and be like, oh, is this solving the problem? Is this the best we could come up with? No, like we need to, we need to make sure that that we're, we're putting forth a design that solves the problem. And it's not, you know, my ego getting in the way. Um, but negative feedback for me, I think, I think it's really helpful. Uh, feedback I've gotten is like, know where that feedback's coming from. If it's from a manager that you trust, like feels has the, like the context of the situation, um, someone who's like really gone through something similar, like definitely try not to get defensive, like take a deep breath. You know, if it's feedback that you think you need to sit with and you don't want to have like an immediate, like defensive reaction or even like negative reaction, like you can always say like, Hey, like, I'm going to like, give me a minute. Like uh, I'll read through this or can you write it down? I'm going to take some time and, and sit with this. And then I'll come back to you with, uh, some changes or, or a solution or, or my perspective on it. Um, yeah, I think if someone is giving you, especially constructive feedback, like they're nine times out of 10, they're investing in you. Like they're, they're taking a gamble with a little bit of their social capital to make sure that, you know, they're hoping that your relationship will survive that feedback and you will both be better for it. Um, so hopefully, you know, you can take that in stride. Uh, and if it's feedback from someone that, you know, you don't feel like has the right context or perspective or experience, um, you can always take it with like a huge grain of salt um, until it becomes a pattern. I've definitely gotten that feedback as well and it has helped. Yeah. So I didn't get to ask Elaine, but I'll ask you and then Elaine, you can also answer at the end. Um, so when building a resume or portfolio, uh, how can people showcase their resilience and success? So to kind of to play off of what Summer said. Yeah, this uh, one, I struggled with. I'm sorry, it. Elaine. <laughs> I confused you all. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You to go first, I'm sorry. It's all good now. We'll work okay. it out. Okay, I'll do it. Um, yeah, I struggled with this question. Uh, it's definitely something, especially portfolio building, that uh, is like the bane of my existence for sure uh, from a design perspective. But I think for me, there's always some piece of the project that you're proud of. Like, even if it's just like one screen or one design or like maybe the visual design was great or maybe this interaction was great. If you can like, or maybe this research phase was really cool. We got some like good conversations or insights out of it. Um, I would say definitely try to cherry pick the win or the learning. Um, and then if you feel like you don't have the space in a resume or portfolio to really put it in context, I'd leave it out if you can. Like if it feels like a failure that is gonna need like an in-person show, like I'll I'll strip it out of like something that's more digital or online and then I'll wait till I'm in person, like on an on-site interview or in a Zoom call so I can give it the proper like space and time. Um, yeah, cause you never wanna see something out of context that it feels like you're not putting forth your, your best work or putting yourself in the best light. That's it, that's it for me, Elaine. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> It's okay. Um, I think that both Summer and Jessica have amazing points. So the only thing that I would add would be to be careful in the way that you word things because you can say something that perhaps was negative and word it in a way that sounds like a positive. So for example, let's say you did a job and you were not like successfully able to communicate with your boss instead of saying that, you can say something like, learned how to communicate in a corporate setting or something like that. Because even though perhaps um, you didn't do well in your opinion, you still there's still a learning experience there that is valuable. And you don't wanna dismiss that. You actually want to tell people that you learned through that, right? So I think it's it always figure out the best way to word those things that you have experienced and the skill sets that you gain from that, even though it may have been a bad experience or a negative experience, it's still a learning experience at the end of the day. So don't um, discredit or dismiss those things just because you perhaps didn't feel good about it because um, there's still things that could be taken away from it. So always look at the silver linings, I would say, okay. when, when bad things happen like that. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna go to the Q&A. Uh, 
Melanie has been kind of watching the chat. If you have any other questions, type them in. I'm going to read one first, and I see there's another one in the chat. Um, so a submitted question, how would you recommend balancing being a student in an intensive major with being a serious esports athlete? Uh, what tips and tricks do you have to be effective in both areas and not lean too far into one or the other? Um, so you want to raise your hand if you want to answer <laughs> or. I can. I can do this now. <laughs> I'm going to preface this by saying that I am speaking from the person who is in professionalized esports, right? I work with the pro esport athletes. So this may not be true for everyone, but my natural gut reaction is like, holy crap, pick one. Uh, the reason is, is that both of those things probably deserve your intense like, effort and attention. Um, and if you are unsure of your overall trajectory, then of course, I'm gonna say, focus on your academics first. Um, I mean, look at how you're doing in your academics. You might have like a situation where, where you're within the lane where you're just like, actually, this isn't really for me. And it'd be really cool to explore esport as a new path, right? So every case is going to be different. Um, but like, I would not suggest trying to split the difference between the two. You kind of have to choose which one is your hobby when push comes to shove, which one is going to have to sack because you do want to be able to put your best foot forward uh, in one or the other. Anybody else? I will say that um, since esports is coming to college more uh, more than it was before, there is a better place. I mean, it's not going to be a serious uh, professional athlete like Summer is saying, but we're trying to focus on finding a balance, just like traditional sports. Um, but again, as Summer said, your academics are going to be first and foremost important. So. You need to always focus on that and then make it second. So I am going to read, I think Summer's going to actually answer this one too. So Alex says, I am a coach of a high school esports team and we compete with play versus. Is there going to be a discussion on ways for teams to improve from losses? Sure. Um, also happy to take extra time beyond this to talk yeah. to anybody from play versus that wants to talk about coaching um because i spent a long time doing it myself the main thing is when you're thinking about recovering from losses you're constantly coming back to the goals that you had set in the beginning a lot of times teams make the mistake of setting result driven goals and it's not to say that you should not have some outcomes in mind that you would like but they're not immovable goalposts. Like sometimes you just were not correct in the assumptions you were making about what you should or should not be able to do. That's true in real life. And that is certainly true in competitive. Um, you are not in the practice room of every team that you compete against. So you don't know what they're bringing to the table. They can honest to God, just show up with a better strat that day. And that's the reality of the competition. So kind of like going into the loss mindset, it's just like, what was that win ever going to get you? Um, what was that one win going to get you? What was several wins going to get you? Okay, so you win a championship this year. Am I done? Does that championship now guarantee me the championship for the following year? There's no one-to-one -one correlation there. So you need to always come back to these process goals instead, the ones that say, this is how we do it. So a lot of the theme that we've talked about today is that success is not a one-time deal. It's not one point that you set. It is a way of being. It is the way that you address yourself, the way you address the people around you that's continually sets you up for more success and like a better probability of success. So there's always that learning point that you can take from every single loss. It's only your job to turn around and say, okay, what are we learning from this? What are we taking into the next one? All right, uh, Dylan posted in there. For me, it's a lot of stress because I place high up in my mind. Uh, but when I tell my parents, they're, they're not impressed. And sometimes it brings me down and I don't know how to deal with it. So how do you deal with it? <laughs> is that is that what you're asking, Dylan? I can share how I've dealt with this kind of pressure before. Okay. Um, and it kind of speaks to one question that was in 
the Q and A, which is to me, if, whatever, if I was ever academically dismissed. Um, when I was in college, I put an insane amount of pressure on myself to do really well. I was never dismissed from an institution. However, I failed myself a lot of the times. I considered getting C's on paper as a failure. I eventually transferred out of my original institution and went to a state college rather than a private. Like these were personal failures in a very big way. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that my parents really wanted me to go to that, that first school. Um, they were very proud that I went in the first place. They were proud to say, hey, my daughter's a Vassar student, right? Um, and it was really, really painful not to meet that expectation. Um, eventually I had to say, there is no degree of stress or hurt that my parents would wish on me, really. I, I was blessed to have two parents that really loved me. And that was, the, that was the reason why they were pushing me. It was out of pure love and hope for my success. And there's really, I don't believe a true parent that wants to hurt their child in this way. So if you can kind of reconcile yourself to that being like, listen, they would not ask me to torture myself this way. How can I look at this a better way? Um, that's like a first place to start. And then you can just kind of break down, like, what do you actually need to be successful? And sometimes it really is moving on. One of the best and most relieving conversations I ever had was when I came home one day and my dad was like, you know, I really want you home with me. Would you consider moving to a state college instead rather than being away? And I was like, oh my God, he's, he's going to be okay if I actually change trajectory. I'm not going to disappoint him irre like irrevocably. Um, so just try to paint in that lens. I think your parents love you and care about you and are more willing to bend than you recognize, especially if you express to them that you're in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And to add, Dylan, like I, I resonate with what you say a lot because I had to go through a lot of uh, difficult situations with my parents regarding expectations on certain things. And what really helped a lot was communication on my end to express how I was feeling um, and I would say 90% of the time, they were always willing to listen and be understanding of how I was feeling. Um, so even if you may be really upset and angry, hold your emotion and do not have those conversations with an emotional mindset, like recollect yourself, figure out what you want to say, on, on, on what you would like to communicate, and then have that conversation. And you may find that after that conversation, you will feel so much more relieved and both of you will be on the same page. And I think that'll really help too. All right. Um, it's probably gonna go a little bit to summer again. I don't, um, should esports teams share a goal? Should individual players have goals or should there be both? Both, 100%. Um, every person should be individually driven um, as anybody anybody can like you can very easily become complacent if you don't have some direction for yourself just because you have energy and passion does not mean it's automatically directed in a productive way so these goals are a really great way to make something that's just very diffuse energy into a laser beam of success um, so really continually goal set to point yourself in a good trajectory team goals are really great because it makes sure that like say you have a team of five people you can have lasers in five different different ways like completely canceling each other out. So making sure you have those team goals, making sure that everybody's energy is pointing in a single direction is really helpful as well. Um, actually, Elaine, I have a question for you because you said that you did a you did a long-term five-year goal. Did you do short-term goals too? Oh yeah, 100%. I live off of planners and uh, little post-it notes and stuff. I have like a this to-do list um, post-it that <laughs> At every day I write down like what are the things that I want to accomplish today and it's so satisfying to cross things off of this list at the end of the day. Um, and I have like a weekly planner and everything so I always set goals for myself because that keeps me focused. Um, but that works for me that may not work for everyone. So um, if maybe having like a monthly calendar where you can cross things off that works for some people. Um, but yeah, I, I live off of short and long term goals. Jessica, you could, you can answer it too. I mean, I think we're all pretty goal oriented from what I've gathered here. 
Of course. Yeah. I discovered for me that daily goals were not as helpful as weekly, uh, especially like personal life goals. Like, oh man, I really need to get laundry done today. Then at like midnight I'm doing laundry and it's just, it's not sustainable. You know, I'll do laundry this week or I'll do, you know, I'll make sure I get, you know, Felix to the, the dog park nearby twice this week. Um, even if it ends up being Thursday, Friday, you know, I think uh, weekly goals really tend to help me more, a little bit more flexible. Uh, so I like this. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I think it, they need to be more tangible. If you do, you know, everyone focuses on that long term. You just have to do short term. Sometimes that's that's all you need to get you through the next one. So, um, and do we have any more questions that we might want to ask? I think there's one in the uh, Q and A uh, thingy. Um, well, he kind of said, Alex said, my esports team is fairly new, but we have players that have played the game for a couple of years and we have a couple that are brand new to it. So maybe what goals to set for your team if for well, individuals? There's like, a, there's like Q and A questions on the bottom. I'll ask him. I don't know if you okay. can see them. I don't so, know. If I, um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, what advice do you have for high school players who put pressure on themselves to always win? I think some are kind of addressed. Oh, yeah. Does anybody have anything they want to add? Yeah, I'll add, uh, if you're someone who tends to put a lot of pressure on yourself, just realize that uh, even the people that you really look up to, like no one wins 100% of the time. And if your, your goals aren't realistic, you're really just setting yourself up uh, for to fail and, and no one's really holding you to that standard. I think as long as your goals um, are, I wanna get better, or I wanna like have like this like personal win for myself, um, especially in like a team sport, um, it can really help reframe um, what a win looks like for you, not just for your whole team. And I'll add that back to a little bit too. So I'm not in new sports, but I, we make games, right? And uh, I can tell you from like, the games that my friends have made all the way to like big triple A games from EA and stuff. When the goal is to make a million dollar game, the game usually fails. And that's because you're putting purpose and intent on the wrong thing. Like my goal in making my game shouldn't be to be million dollars. My goal should be to make a good game. So it's just, I feel like it's the same thing with playing esports. Your goal should not always be to win. It should be how can I get better every single time and be an asset to my team or help my teammates get better too. Like it's it's never about the outcome, but always about the process. Cause that's really what's gonna shape you into that incredible athlete. It's not all the wins. That's not what shapes you. What shapes you is the journey to get there. Yeah, and I just wanna add what I would actually say to a team um, is that you need to cope with the outcome that you think you can't handle. A lot of times the pressure is coming from the fact that you're just like, I literally have no other option but to win. I have no option to fail because there's nothing I can do if I did. And the fact of the matter is, is that there is a thousand percent things that you can do when you fail. When you come out of a loss, you can make the choice to be proactive, to dissect what happened, to look at those mistakes and ensure that they don't happen again right? You can include all those learnings into the next game and ensure that you have a higher probability of success the next time. That is a real plan. So making sure that you are taking time to cope ahead with that thing that you do not think is surmountable. It's very similar to what we said in terms of just general failure overall. I said, like, you really need to make peace with the worst outcome that you possibly have in your head. And if you can come up with a strategy for how you can overcome it ahead of Awesome. Thank you. And then this will be our last question. We'll kind of wind down. Thanks everyone for staying long. Uh, what would be your opinion on how to deal with stressed or prideful teammates during or after a game or project? I feel like this one's too easy for me to answer. I want to actually hear from like project-based side because <laughs> I deal um, with this day in and day out. <laughs> I would say um, like in making games together when people are in, on like high emotions, um, it's never 
the right time when people are like on super high alert, like on edge to bring things up. Um, usually what we do when things like that happen at our, at our studio or even in my friendships, like when we have arguments, um, we wait until everybody kind of cools off a little bit. And then we have what we call a decompression session where we can sit down and in, in like literally sometimes it, it most often than not involves food. So we will order food um, and we'll hang out and eat. And then we'll talk about, you know, what happens. And it, it, it helps for everybody to not be on edge because that way we can communicate better with each other uh, and pinpoint what the real issues are so that we can solve for them and do better next time or whatever it may be. So this is not just like esports, this is like a life thing. Um, anytime that you see, you know, when you have an argument with somebody, when people are on edge, that's really usually not the best time to try to solve things. It's when they cool down a little bit and they have time to like think and process and you get them a chance to think about those things so that you can actually sit down and talk um, and pinpoint what's wrong. Um, when it comes with pride, that's really hard because pride can manifest itself in different ways for different people. And it's um, one of those buttons that you have to be very careful with. Um, I only deal with that with people that I really trust, that I can, I know that I can sit down with them and they can take a good critique. Um, and they know that I'm not coming from a place where I want to bring them down or humiliate them in any way. They know it's coming out of me caring about them and wanting them to be better. Um, so just definitely be careful. So if you trust your teammates, if or teammates trust you to be the person that they can kind of open up and be vulnerable with when it comes to their pride and their ego, um, then be that person for them and, and, and hear them out and give them try to give them good advice. And if you need to bring the coach in because it was it was something like really really bad, maybe you can have a team dinner or a team pizza night or something and figure things out. But I feel like that has helped me in in our studio. It's just having actual conversations and it's usually not when the bad thing happens. All right. So um, thanks again, guys. You are all amazing and we appreciate the advice today that you gave. So is there anything else you wanna leave our participants with that they need to know or tidbits? Yeah, I think for me, um, I would just say, you know, recognize that y'all are y'all are doing hard things every day. Um, and sometimes more often than not, if you're doing something hard, failure is just a part of that. And, and everyone's really gone gone through that. And, and it really, uh, how you react to it and how you uh, form relationships during it um, can really help you further down the line. So yeah, if you're able to, uh, some of the best friendships and, and working relationships I've had have come from like really big professional and even school academic failures. So, you know, you're always, there's usually always someone who's, who's struggling with you and find those people and, and, uh, reach out if you need, we're always here too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just want to jump in on the last question with regard to dealing with the ego, dealing with people who are emotional, we're all emotional creatures. Like, you know, that's what motivation is. Motivation is your emotion and your drive to go and complete something. If you didn't care, you wouldn't do it. Um, so just try to be real with the process, right? Like I said, like sometimes I have days where I'm just like, man, I freaking suck. And then I have to like get myself out of that and just have a real conversation with myself. And when you're dealing with highly emotional people, sometimes you don't have the luxury of taking time. Sometimes you have to fight through what is really painful to get to the other side. And that's really, it's very helpful to call a spade a spade at that point being like, Hey, like I hear you. You're really aggravated. You're speaking really loudly to me. I'm having a hard time hearing you. I just need us both to take a deep breath and work through this. Right? Like. I coach myself on that stuff all the time, just trying to get through the moment and push through. It's tough stuff. It's not always meant to feel good. And sometimes you're going to have the most amazing opportunities come out of some of the toughest stuff that you weather. Yeah. And I would end on the same thing. Like we think that failure, we have been conditioned to believe that failure is a bad thing and it's always negative and it's really not. And I feel like the more, uh, you grow into your career, into your life, you'll realize that, that there ne is never going to be a moment in your life where everything that you do is going to be 100 perfect, amazing every single time. Like 
that's nearly impossible. We don't live in utopia. So be, em, em, embrace the fact that through your through the, your failures, you are growing. And they're just, see them as growing pains. They're uncomfortable, they hurt, but it's only to get to a better spot. It's never to, to like uh, climb down the ladder. It's always to climb up. So I definitely don't see it as a bad thing. And that really helped me too in, in growing is not to see failures as a bad thing. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we'll post the recording on playverses.com, and we'll share the recap on socials. So for more information on Play Versus Game Changers initiative, visit playverses.com forward slash game hyphen changers. Uh, in the meantime, connect with us on at Play Versus on socials, and we'll learn, you'll learn about the next panel that comes up and more to come. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.